I have the privilege of being here with my dear friend, Warren Leroy Johns. And you folks deserve to know our friend, Warren, and a little bit about how he got to be, where he is, who he is at this point in his life. So Warren, I know you have uh, had roots here in Loma Linda, well, at the beginning. It was near the beginning. Uh, my dad was uh, president of the Minnesota Conference, and he was invited to come to Loma Linda in 1936 to be Bible teacher and to be pastor of the college church at Burden Hall. I uh, just turned seven years old, and I had the privilege of growing up in Loma Linda. Your play field, as I recall a little of the story I've heard before, were the orange groves largely. Uh, <laughs> with, yeah, uh, we would play in those orange groves. Uh, and we would throw oranges at each other, and uh, we also had the benefit of the hills. We were always hiking in the hills with canteens of water, looking for gold, looking for rattlesnakes, rabbits, etc. Uh, it was an outdoor life. And before we left Loma Linda in 1945, I had the privilege of working on the ground crew of, of the old sanitarium. And I also worked in the kitchen, washing dishes and carrying trays to the patients. And ultimately I became what they called a call boy, where I pushed wheelchairs with the patients and I, I carried their suitcases and I ran the elevator. How did a preacher's son get the uh, redirection to law. In my junior year, last year, I took a, an aptitude test. And I came out pretty good for law. And I decided right then, I'm gonna be a lawyer. And to make my parents feel good, I said, I'm gonna be a lawyer for the church. So I went on to the seminary, and after I got my master's degree in church history, which I thought church history would relate a lot to religious liberty, I uh, was called to Lansing where the conference office was. And every two weeks I'd go out and preach a sermon, and uh, it was all coming from my head. And I was giving pretty good sermons, I thought, and finally, uh, it was, the door was opening for me to come to California and to go to school at, Los, at University of Southern California School of Law. And so at the end of my talk, I just said, oh, by the way, this is my last Sabbath here. And I went to the door and I was stunned by these people coming out, shaking my hand, shedding tears. I wasn't shedding tears. What I had done, I'd given them my head I was paid to do that. But those people gave me their hearts. I've never forgotten that. I went to USC because they didn't have Sabbath classes, but they charged tuition. But I felt if I was going to serve the church, I had to go without going to class on Sabbath. What I didn't count on was that occasionally there would be a Sabbath examination. So I went to the administration and there was a young woman there named Nellie Wolf. And I explained to her who I was and what I believed. And she says, well, I'll arrange it. And she did. Wow. Every, every Sabbath test that came up, except one. There was one course in real estate where the, the professor had to be the one to decide whether I took the test on Sabbath or not. And it was like a court martial in his office. I was standing at attention. His feet were up on his desk. He was smoking a big cigar. And he said, uh, South Day Adventist, uh, like, uh, yeah, what, did, don't you have some kind of a commune or something in Berrien Springs? I said, well, yeah, they, there's a university or a college there, yeah. So he said, okay, supposing the bar is on Sabbath, what are you gonna do then? And I said, well, I just read in the Adventist Review that three young nursing students in Africa, in one of the African countries, deferred for three years before they could take the test to become a registered nurse. B 
because of the Sabbath test. And I said, I think I would do what they did. He said, he looked me in the eye and he said, John, I think you're crazy. I said, well, that's what I believe. I, I have to do what I believe. He took his feet off the desk and began to laugh. He said, John, I still think you're crazy, but you, don't, you take it anytime you want. I felt that I had to stand for what I believed in or what would happen to other Seventh-day Adventists that followed me. Tell us a little bit about uh, how you became general counsel for the General Conference. I was stationed in Sacramento and I was in my office one day and I get this call from somebody I didn't know. Warren, he said, uh, I knew your brother Alger, that was my older brother who had been a minister, but he said, uh, we need a lawyer back here. And he, he says, I've heard, heard it said that you're not interested in leaving California. And I said, that's right. And he said, but could I interest you to come back here to just look, look it over? And to make a long story short, I did go back there. And I thought, you know, I'll try it for a year. I stayed for 17 years. Wow. I stayed till I retired. I took my job uh, not as a defender per se, but an overseer to look ahead to see what we could do to improve the church, to protect the church. I, I found out the, the name of the church was not trademarked and protected. And we initiated that. The Review and Herald in those days was based in Tacoma Park, right on the, right barely inside District of Columbia. They were paying $60,000 a year in taxes to the district government. And I asked them why, and they said, well, we don't know, they just bill us. And I said, but you're a, you're a church publishing, you're right next to the world headquarters of the church. Would you like me to see if I can legally work on that? And of course they said yes. From that moment on, they saved $60,000 a year wow. of taxes. That's neat. Um, a lot of things like that, um, I felt I was there to do. I have thought about it many times, knowing my personality, my genes. I don't think I would have ever gone to an evangelistic meeting. I doubt if I had ever been a, a church member of any faith, but because I was put into it. Then to top it off, to grow in grace, all the mistakes I've made, all of the tragic errors of judgment I've made, because of the faith I have, I know it's all forgiven. I know that Amen. it's not me, it's the Lord. It's Christ's perfection that covers my flawed life. So I really didn't have anything to do with it. It's all. God's blessing. To but me. here we get to be, Warren, to say thank you, God. Absolutely. That at this point, the 21st century now, yes. we get to testify yes. about the value of God's leading throughout the experience of the Seventh-day Adventist family, and we get to be a part of it.